So everybody, or most of you know uh, Switch probably, and uh, you might ask, ask yourself, what the hell has Switch got to do with clouds? Because we've been uh, associated with domains for a long, long time. So who of you know Switch outside of the domain business? All right, two or three. Um, in the words of the, the great Granny Weatherwax, I ain't dead yet. Uh, switch is not domains. And, and uh, let me take this opportunity to, to clear up that misconception that you may have. Switch is a non-profit foundation uh, that was funded by the uh, universities and um, the federation about 26, 27 years ago. Uh, we connect the universities. Uh, we run a couple of thousand kilometers of fiber um, across Switzerland. We do things like single sign-on, federated sign-on. Um, there is uh, a public Wi-Fi here that is operated in partly through us. We do lecture recordings and so on and so forth. And uh, the, um, the, the whole domain thing was kind of accidentally dropped in our lap in 87 when um, Bernhard Platner re registered .ch back in the days and then said, oh, I don't know what to do with it. Oh, Switch, you take it, you take care of that. So we did, um, we run the registry for Switzerland for CH and LI, and we have been doing the main registrations um, until this year. And uh, a lot of, of uh, companies now have told you that we are dead. Uh, we aren't. We are actually doing quite well, thank you very much. We are focusing on, on uh, doing established services to, to the community, and um, that's anything from procuring um, software for universities to uh, working on, on ID questions. We, we want to have every student a, to have a personal ID that that uh, continues to live on through his academic life. Uh, we do um, security stuff. We have a run our own cert, etc. So uh, Switch is opening the knowledge space is our mission, and uh, we are part of the university landscape. And we run a cloud, of course. Everybody runs a cloud, so uh, we also had to run a cloud. And uh, we see, uh, we do two things. We run infrastructure as a service, as uh, Thomas mentioned earlier, as everybody does. We also run a bunch of software as a service things. I've I just learned we cannot call them cloud services anymore. Um, but still, they run on our cloud, so we'll keep that. We have a uh, sync and share service similar to Dropbox. We uh, can send files. We have the ability to record and cast lectures um, and has have a, a video distribution tool. So I want to talk a bit about what it takes to build a cloud. Uh, we've heard from, from Thomas about wh what cloud is, what it encompasses, um, and I want to take you a bit behind the scenes. So our cloud is, is distributed in Zurich and in, in Lausanne. Consists of it's fairly small. It's about uh, 70 um, servers at the moment that have uh, a couple of hundred terabytes or 1.5 petabyte storage capacity and about 1,200 cores uh, that we can run. Um, hardware part is easy in clouds. You, you take commercial off-the-shelf uh, stuff, uh, low-cost, medium performance. Um, you don't need any brand names on them. You just buy whatever is cheapest. The uh, the software is easy as well if you believe um, people like OpenStack or organizations like OpenStack. You just go there, download the software, and and run it on your laptop, run DevStack, and you're done. Right. Well, um, we found out there is a bit more to it to actually run a cloud, and the the, the OpenStack part is important, but it's only a, a small part. And I'm not going to focus on that because you all know what cloud is. Um, I'll take you through uh, in the few minutes that. That I have, I'll take you through some of the supporting acts uh, in that infrastructure, and, and just to give you an, an image of how um, how many things there need to be done in order to run a cloud service. So uh, this is our basic architecture. We have two separated, uh, geographically separated um, OpenStack regions: one in Zurich, one in Lausanne. They are connected um, through a proxy service. The proxy service handles all connections between 
users and API consumers and the actual services. Um, there is a central uh, ID module keystone which handles users and, and projects. And we have two completely separated uh, OpenStack instances that run on, on a bunch of compute nodes and um, uh, connect to a bunch of storage nodes. But the two regions don't actually see each other. They are totally separated, like Amazon regions, if you will. Um, we have a, w when you run cloud, you, you need to run storage. Uh, it isn't enough to have just a server with a bunch of disks in it. You have to have multiple servers with a number of disks. We're using Ceph, as had been mentioned before. Um, we're currently, you, you see some live numbers here. This is one of the small clusters, 125 OSDs. OSDs are disks that give us uh, something like 454 terabytes of available disk space that we can use. And, and the cluster, when I took this the snapshot, was, was running at a fairly low um, intensity. It does uh, some 10 megabytes reads and 10, 14 megabytes of writes per second. This is not loaded. I don't know why nobody was working at that time, but there you go. So you need some kind of storage, and, and uh, Ceph is a distributed, software-defined storage solution that is uh, said to be fail-safe, infinitely scalable. You just add more disks, add more servers, and it will take care of everything itself. When you have infrastructure, you also need to um, provision that infrastructure. Your colleagues to told us about uh, how they do it with Foreman and Puppet. We do exactly the same thing. So we have all our infrastructure uh, in a Foreman server that knows um, which server is in what role. We can uh, tell each server what role it is. So this is a, uh, what do we have? The controller of the Lausanne cluster, which is, uh, uh, has some Cinder and Clans and Nova and uh, controller puppet classes defined to it. And um, what this setup allows us to do is to rack up new servers, enter the MAC address of the server in Foreman, switch them on and they will come up, uh, get all the necessary configuration, installation of software, and then be part of our cluster. So that is, is fully automated as well. We use Puppet as a configuration management, not because we personally love Puppet. Actually, I think it's, it's uh, I've seen better, but it's very well supported in the community. So we go with that. There's a huge um, uh, community that builds modules. Um, also for OpenStack things. And you can you can sort of get a, a big catalog and the only thing is you need to actually write a little bit of glue modules that uh, go and build the actual cluster. So uh, the way to do that or the way we do it is we have um, a bunch of code in Puppet here. Oh, this is uh, the definition of uh, a controller and we keep all our code separate from the configuration. We use a, a tool called Hiera, which gives is a hierarchical definition of configuration parameters. And as you can see on the left side, we have, um, we have in, in various levels of, of uh, deepness, we have defined our cloud, what the network addresses are, what uh, number of nodes, special parameters, IPv4, IPv6, address spaces, and so on and so forth. So two totally separate uh, software projects, if you will. And uh, then some, some glue code that takes all of these modules and puts them together in a, in a coherent um, cloud way, or builds, actually builds the cloud. And this is the, the difficult part of, of writing a cloud because you, you get all the building blocks like like when you were a kid you got a box of Legos um, now what you do with them you have to pull put them together the problem is nobody has really written the building plan right if you get a box of Legos you get this nice manual with OpenStack you get a, a bunch of kind of working recipes that are um, that will set up something that resembles a cloud but then you have to do a lot of tweaking and, and building your own to actually get get it to uh, in a state where we actually can use it, and we found that um, when we talk to other 
companies that, that run clouds, all of them have uh, di very different architectures, very different uh, networking and so on. I think so it's very difficult to just take this glue code and move it from one installation to another. You have to write it yourself. Uh, as if one orchestration tool is not enough, Puppet, we have another orchestration tool that orchestrates the orchestration. Um, we use Ansible to actually do upgrades to our tool. I'm not going into that. It's uh, instead of being run continuously, we can trigger certain steps at a specific point in time and specific um, uh, in a specific uh, order. Uh, you might have seen that we deployed version 1.3 here of, of uh, our cloud software. We use GitLab, which is a GitHub clone, to run the whole operations as a software project. So we have uh, multiple repositories. We have discussions about code. We have code reviews, um, merge requests. And we treat this, this uh, the whole cloud, as a DevOps project. So there's a lot of development in it. The other interesting thing that uh, needs to be talked about is monitoring. We, we basically, when you have a bunch of 70 servers, things will go wrong at all points in time, and we need to be aware of what goes wrong. So we have an Agios that uh, monitors all these servers and tells us various cryptic, sends us various cryptic mails about lossy connections and dropping messages, and we have to figure out what the hell is wrong with that again, and has the cloud survived? Um, we actually go in and monitor the load of our systems. We go in and, and probe the hypervisors to see um, who is using it. So in, in general, there is very little load. The, uh, the scale up here is number of CPU cores that are in use. So on a, on a given day, something like 25 of our thousand cores are in use, unless the University of Zurich decides to run some experiments on them and then we see some spikes, but we need to be aware of what what is uh, being done on the cloud. Um, we also measure performance. We want to understand how our cloud performs. So we are using a tool called Rally from the OpenStack uh, world that is was used as a performance monitoring, performance benchmarking tool. It allows you to write uh, scripts that say start 30 VMs, migrate them from one host to another, tear them down again. We run these tests continuously on our cloud to see if the um, if the performance of these clouds change, and uh, we will be able to detect anomalies hopefully faster than that. Um, we also, of course, are into the uh, billing and charging things. So we have built our own solution, uh, or working on building an, uh, our own solution um, to tell us what user in what project in what institution is using how much uh, cpu time ram time disk time we can aggregate that across um, institutions we obviously we we want to provide this service to universities universities made up of, of several research labs or lecturers and so on and openstack doesn't have any good way of showing you who is using how much of the precious resources um, those of you that have uh, worked with OpenStack have seen this interface. We found that it is uh, was designed by programmers, loved by programmers, and is is kind of error prone for normal users. So we are working on writing our own simple UI that that gives a very very simple um, way of of just doing the most basic tasks: starting a virtual machine, selecting an image. That is work that is in progress now. These are some of the uh, the screen mockups that I received this week. Uh, we hope to have that in place in the next couple of months, and so on. So OpenStack is is all fine and dandy, but you need a lot more infrastructure around it to uh, to actually build a cloud offering that you can go out and use and that will not blow up on you in the most inconvenient times. So you need a, a bunch of tools, you need to cho uh, choose them. You also need a team that has a very broad skill set. It, it's everything from system administration to development and um, uh, virtualization support and uh, Python debugging and God knows what. It's, it's, uh, it's a well-rounded job profile that you are looking for. And uh, then when you have this uh, 
actually up and running, then um, when you build it, they will come, and they will come with all kinds of really interesting um, use cases. So everything from from network simulations to people that trace the stem tree of uh, Greek uh, handwritings across the dec uh, centuries. Um, we have people that run Atlas experiments from CERN on our VM. Somebody even installed a Lotus Domino server. God knows what they <laughs> thinking about that. Uh, and of course, we have users that uh, do fun things like uh, install a Tor exit node, and uh, you get emails from our from the search teams or from other abuse. Uh, we got email from Paramount about somebody sharing a really bad movie. Um, there's all kinds of things you need to to take care of, and we were kind of disappointed about the choice of movie that the uh, the user. Um, and also, there's there's the uh, all the the uh, small things that that just trip you up. Uh, I talked about the user interface. Uh, there's a those that know OpenStack knows there is a public interface, uh, a network interface. If you choose that and try to launch a machine, it will not run because public is public, but not for the public, if you will. So it needs you need to do the private in order to get a public IP address, which is kind of counterintuitive. Um, if you have network nodes, they uh, can go down, take all the uh, the network traffic to the into the cloud with you. Uh, we have uh, this totally distributed, no single point of failure, uh, high-end software-defined storage system that will is able to cope with any kind of failure that you throw at it, unless you have a disk that goes bad and and sort of comes online, goes offline, comes online, goes offline, takes down the uh, performance of the whole cluster. Um, we have these performance tools that I told you about that we run continuously. They uh, create projects and destroy projects again. They create security groups or access control lists and don't destroy them again. That's a bug. So we end up with uh, IP table rules with 70,000 entries on our hypervisors. We have to purge those from time to time. Um, Keystone services, there's a catalog of services uh, that you can query or a, a software, an API consumer can query and um, when that grows too big, um, some kind of hashing mechanism switches over to a different hashing format and instead of your tokens being 4K in size, they become 64K in size or 80K in size. And of course the database table that holds them is only designed to hold 64K of data and the bug has been known for three years now and it's supposed to be fixed maybe in the M release. So we're at Icehouse, Juno, um, Kilo, Liberty, and then some unknown release M after that. Maybe it will be fixed by then. There's all kinds of, of really fun things to, to keep your you and your team on your toes when you, when you decide to run a cloud. Um, nonetheless, we do that. Um, and we have uh, switch engines. Um, some of you may know this engine here, the uh, model of the, the difference engine, one of the, the first computers. Uh, as a service to the cloud and as a, a really interesting project all by itself to keep up and running. So that was the, the very quick, I, I don't want to stand too long in front of your you and the coffee, but if you have any questions, I'll, I'm happy to take those or find me afterwards at the, uh, the coffee. <laughs>